Good afternoon. Um, my name is Shabina Aslam, and I'm uh, very excited to be interviewing Dr. Yunus Alam of Bradford University this evening about his new book, which I have here, um, Race, Taste, Class and Cars. I've been dipping through it and it's, it's a fascinating read and um, I'm hoping that we'll get a chance to talk about it in greater detail. So Eunice was born oh. and brought up in Bradford, uh, went to school here and then worked in um, a, a mill. He's also been an ambulance driver until he was made redundant and uh, went to university, Bradford University, as a mature student. And he's been there ever since. So Eunice, welcome. Hello again. Thank you. Nice to be here in my office at home where I'm always at. <laughs> so, t so tell me, why cars? Why have you written a book about cars? Uh, th there's quite a lot of reasons. Um, I guess w one is a quite an obvious one is that they're sort of ubiquitous. They're everywhere, you know, it's, and it's something that we take for granted. Uh, and I suppose that if I drill down into that, uh, one of the added dimensions is the presence of the car in Bradford and what it means in Bradford. And I think it is to some extent uh, a bit different, a bit idiosyncratic in terms of its meaningfulness. And I think the third reason is probably um, because I'm always, I, I tend to be drawn toward the sort of ordinariness of life within my sociological work. So everything I've done sociologically has been pretty much in, in some ways either banal or everyday. And I, I'm not particularly enamored with the with a kind of high profile stuff around, uh, and it's invariably around identity and ethnic identity. So I'm not particularly attracted to, to the narratives around black and minority ethnicities being sort of projected through a lens wherein they are usually problematic. So in the case of Bradford, Pakistanis Muslims, um, there are lots of narratives around how how Muslims are either represented or perceived or understood uh, and it's not that I well I don't fully buy into a lot of those narratives if at all but I'm also much more uh, I guess it's almost a, a work of politics I'm much more interested in pushing a slightly different angle as to look as to basically saying in a nutshell that this is how life arguably really is rather than the high profile news stories and the scandals and whatever those storylines are you know I, I i it's not to dismiss them outright or anything like that but I, and it's not really about me trying to rebalance things but it is about presenting counter narratives um so that's one of the reasons why the car, car seems so easy in a way uh and it's something that i've experienced growing up in bradford you know as a kid and then as a younger man uh, as a driver and then uh, as an older driver uh, and it's you not say in, um, sorry you say in no, your no. book uh, the cars were a part of a make do culture can you talk a bit about that what does that mean uh well i, I think in some ways they still are there was it, it wasn't make do but it, it that, that it wasn't precisely that phrase it's the art of making do i think yeah, it, and right. it's a culture of making do yeah and and that is borrowed from a different sociological standpoint perspective around cultural studies so so sort of 1950s 60s 70s sociologists were writing about so even if you think about the 1970s or 80s and beyond about young youth subcultural movements like punk or ska or uh, or two-tone or alternative musics and indeed hip-hop as well and you'd find that there were these rather innovative uh, usages of mainstream culture uh, so, you know, if you think about hip hop, for example, one of its bedrocks is the re recycling of music. So you take a, a piece of vinyl that was produced 30 years ago, you know, a song from the 60s, you mess about with it, you scratch and you produce new rhythms and you produce new texts, new new songs or whatever. So that is kind of a, a version of that bricolage. It's in the literature, it's known as bricolage and appropriation and excorporation. And it's essentially about taking things and using them for ways they in which they weren't originally intended. So the young so, people, so the people were in your, not the, just the young people, so the, um, the men in your study 
uh, are an example of a subculture. Is that what you're saying? Cars uh, not, are a manifestation uh, of a subculture. Not not entirely. No, I mean I mean there are different layers and strata. So there is one element, and in most urban diverse and when I use the word diverse I mean diverse not just ethnically diverse but in terms of class and wealth and that sort of thing you will find that there are these all sorts of subcultures whether it's around music whether it's around uh, particular movements or indeed artifacts or, or, or things that we consume and how we consume them and cars are one of those things so it, it, as in, in Bradford there is a very vibrant scene around that uh, I've yet to kind of fully decide whether it is a subculture or not, but let's just say for argument's sake it is. So this subculture is is invariably, but not exclusively, I must say that, you know, there the were, and there are women who are very visible and pronounced within this culture whereby you have a car and you do stuff to it to make it stand out, to make it distinctive. And the definition of this distinctiveness and variation of that, it really is in the eye of the beholder, or in this case, the eye of the producer, i.e. you, the owner. So you have younger drivers invariably, but not exclusively so. So, and again, you have uh, Pakistani heritage, but again, there are lots of white indigenous working class young men and women who do the same thing. They do it slightly differently or they do it with different models uh, in terms of brand preferences. And they will make these things a vision of their own. It, it's not something that rolled off the factory production line. It becomes quite unique and it, and it really draws on that person's own visioning of what this car can look like. It's got a lot to do, it's got a lot of things in common with sort of subcultural practice in that members of the subculture know and recognize each other without actually physically knowing each other. You know, you don't have, you can, and, you, and, and they acknowledge each other. And uh, so there is this kind of repertoire of skills and knowledge and experience whereby the subculture continues to thrive uh, and at one level, it's a very healthy subculture because I, I argue that actually it's not empty and it's not vacuous, it's not pointless, it's not a waste. It seems to be very important and meaningful for the people who enact it. For the people who take part in it, it is very, very, uh, it's a very compelling and significant moment in their lives. But the weird thing is, it's not received that way by by outsiders to the culture. It seems. It seems, seems to me you're saying it's a political act. Well, again, you, uh, that, that's me from the outside to some extent looking in and being an academic and saying, well, this is an act of resistance. Yes. They're resisting these mainstream hegemonic values as to what constitutes good and bad and what constitutes good taste. And, and I'll be absolutely honest, most of the people I've spoken to, they never situated it in, that, in those terms. I did try pushing it and I did try provoking it and most of them were kind of, you know, just to even bring it back a bit more. Uh, when I was saying, well, yeah, this is really creative work, right? This is really interesting. I mean, is it, is it artistic? And and the majority of them were like, begrudgingly almost, sort of acknowledging that maybe it's artistic. And again, that kind of falls into a different sort of politics of identity. I don't really like identity politics as an idea as such. But there is this within work. I mean, this is historical, and it's been written about by much better academics than I have, going back to the 1950s and 60s, and even before where they were talking about working class cultures basically being absent, that, that they didn't exist unless it was, it was a middle class kind of culture where things like theatre, literature, art, uh, painting, all those kind of quite worthy things, that's what constituted culture. But, but you know, the way people talked, you know, we were in Yorkshire, flat caps, whippets, all that stuff, fish and chips, that wasn't culture. That was just th things that people do. And of course, now we know much better that we, cons we, we can see working class, for example, culture as something that is highly meaningful and valid and it has a reason for existing. You know, every culture has its own versions of everything else that every other culture has. So, you know, even things like art, song, all those things have a, I, gu I guess they have a manifestation, they have a performance, they have an element that can be recognized. But when it comes to working class cultures, they're still, I would argue, quite stigmatized. Now, this isn't mm -hmm. me speaking on behalf of the people who took part in the research. I'm not speaking for them. This is me trying to make sense of what I've encountered. So this isn't necessarily internal to them. This isn't something that they necessarily uh, endeavor with. Although it may be operant you know, for some more than others. Some people are quite conscious of the fact that I know what I'm doing with my car offends people. You know, I've had conversations with people who, who do modifications with their cars 
and they're quite uh, comfortable with with being resistant and being known to be resistant. And I think that's quite a, a good thing. I think that's, you know, a, as far as, uh, in a sense, a kind of, not in, entitlement, but a, a, an assertion of who you think you are. It's it's kind of lacking to some extent. And, it, and even more than that, this is about individuation, right? This is about how we profess to be ourselves and make our own spaces in the world uh, and make sense of it. I could talk more, but I won't. No, that was brilliant. I loved the. I I was really excited by that about it being working class resistance, and uh, I totally bought that. Um, within what's available to you, you get a car and you're resisting, and that I felt that's that was what the book was, did so beautifully. And you so you talk about uh, you're passionate about the ordinariness of life. Yes. So yeah. and I, I suppose that is also your research method ethnography and the ordinariness of life and the fact that you're also talking about yourself yourself yeah. and the ordinariness of life can you explain to us how you use those things in right. this research i will try um so for, for me ethnography is a kind of an approach that i stumbled into and and i think i got better at it over the years what know. is it well, I, I, I'm going to try to explain, and, and it, it might be helpful if, if I can kind of try to explain some of the things that ethnographers do, uh, and, and not give you an, an academic definition, because I haven't got these things memorized or anything like that. But ethnography is really about trying to tap into a particular culture, and that culture can be at any time, any place, and, and sort of live the culture as the participants live and experience the culture and by so it's a very qualitative method it's very much about rich in-depth insight now for me it's it wasn't particularly difficult because i was i was keen to do an eth well I, i've always done ethnographies in bradford and i've always done ethnographies with people who are in quotes like me and like me is quite a wide range of attributes so but, but generally I'm talking about people who are in some way uh, ethnic minority, not necessarily Pakistani heritage, which is what I am, uh, not necessarily working class heritage, which is what I was, right? So, I, so, uh, so ethnography is very much about the subjectivity of the researcher. That, that's my reading of ethnography. And I say my reading of ethnography because it's got different readings upon which, uh, upon different ethnographers. There are some things that they all share, more or less, in terms of the things that you do. But uh, the ethnographies that I've done, they're really about allowing me to tap into something that I've already got commonality with. So for me, being an insider was really important because Bradford's one of those venues, so this or a research site that has been researched to death. It really has. Going back to the 60s, you know, it, it's had cycles of research around, you know, Bradford is a place in the 1960s where there's a growing BME population. Those phrases weren't used in those days, but but you had people doing their PhDs or you had geographers or you had uh, sociologists coming in, working out what it is that's going on in this new minority ethnic culture. And then subsequently you had 10 years later, 15 years later, you had another sort of tranche of academics and researchers coming in and saying, what's the experience of these people like now? And then you had another tranche, another decade later, how do these people encounter racial discrimination? So it's, it's and, and you know, what do people think of the riots? Or what do people think about radicalization? What do people think about forced marriage? You know, I've been involved in some of those projects and I got fed up with it, right? So there's a lot of research fatigue in Bradford. And it's not that I'm one of these people who thinks that, you know, you, 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 we can't have outsiders coming in. It's not that at all. But I do like to think that you've got to have some degree of resonance and connection with the people that you're researching for my approach to work. So for me, you know, part of my ethnography involves talking to people opportunistically. You know, a, a number of the people that took part in this book, I met them while I was getting my car fixed in a garage. I just struck up a conversation and the next thing you know, I'm seeing these people once or twice a month, telephoning them, whatever, and eventually possibly interviewing them. So it's about being available, being on, being ready to commit, but also, you know, and it's, you know, research, generally speaking, for me is, is quite a political thing. And it's where you go in to either individuals, participants, communities, whatever, and you mine them for data, especially the case with qualitative research, whether you're doing interviews, focus, 
first focus groups and so on. So you, you just mine people for data, and then at the end of that data generation phase, it's often the case, not always the case. There are people who do it differently and very, uh, I guess, reflectively and very thoughtfully. Uh, but generally speaking, it's right. Thank you very much for your research. I'll see you later. And now I'm going to go write an article. Or I'm going to complete my PhD. And then I'm going to become an academic, right? It's not entirely as mercenary as I'm painting it. But I wanted something a bit more kind of pure, a bit more textured, a bit more, on not honest, uh, but a bit more long lasting than that. So the people I did that I, I worked with, I, I recruited for my ethnographies back in the early 2000s, I still know most of them now. I consider them friends. Now, it's not the case that I'm a terribly sad and lonely person that I have to do this in order to make friends. It's not the case. It's just that the depth of the interactions is so that you end up you know, either liking or disliking these people. <laughs> so ethnography is a very kind of personable, immersive process as a methodology. And it's about you committing as much as your participants do. So in the early phases when I'm talking to people about my research, I'm kind of telling them more about myself than I'm asking of them. Just as a way of saying, look, it's not so much that I'm on your side, but I'm from Bradford. I know what the stories are in Bradford. And I know that you know, because most people do. Most people in Bradford, you talk to them about the narratives about Bradford and their narratives, i.e. Pakistanis in Bradford or whatever, they will tell you chapter and verse. They're not daft. You know, people are very savvy as to what's circulating about them. Uh, and and by doing that, by being open, I think it opens up some quite valuable, quite rich, highly valid data. Of course, it's not data through which you can make sort of national population wide generalizations, but that's not the point. That's not the purpose of the endeavor. So you gathered lots of stories from friends about cars and their passion for cars. No, not really. Well, they ended up becoming friends. I, I kind of, uh, I mean, look, you know, for what it's worth, I ended up uh, kind of dumping a few participants mm -hmm. because it was just way too risky. It was yeah. just, too, you know, I mean, it was just ethically very problematic in terms of some of their uh, activities, shall we say. And I thought, you know, I just don't need to get in trouble with the law. So I just said, look, thanks, but no thanks. So invariably it involved, you know, talking to people I'd never meet. I, I, I'd go to car meets, the, the, the subculture, sub, you know, for people who are modifying their cars. What is a car meet? A car meet. Uh, a, a car meet, I mean, that's the phrase I use. I think that's what they use as well. It's basically, there are a few, not exactly ad hoc, they're coming much more systematic these days and much more well organized. Uh, kind of user groups, community groups, and they're based along uh, commitment to the car and modifications of to the car. So you turn up, the, and, and it'd be invariably organized by a few people who are kind of heading up these groups. So, uh, I'm, and I'll confess to some of the other relevant detail in due course, uh, which is relevant here, but it's just gonna kind of interrupt my <laughs> answer now. Uh, um, so, uh, and what they do is they're, they're kind of uh, on a, usually on an evening, uh, they, they'll meet up sometimes uh, 100, 200 cars, all very specialist cars, ranging from 30 year old, 40 year old classics that are in meticulous condition to much newer models, hot hatches that have been souped up, that have had their engines remapped, that have had custom paintwork, exhaust, wheels, you name it. And also very, very expensive prestige cars, Rolls Royce, Bentley, Lamborghinis, the lot. They turn up and they just share the experience amongst themselves. There's more than that going on, I'm sure. Uh, they look at each other's cars. They do a lot of car talk. They talk about the cars, what's going on under the hood. What's this? How long did it take you to do this? And it's not just young people and it's not just, you know, Pakistani men. Uh, one of one or two of these car meets and within certain car clubs, there, there are very well-known characters. One of them I was fascinated to meet. He's a, he, I'm sure he's in his 70s, a, 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 a white pensioner. And when he talks about his car, He's like, a, you know, he's, he, he can kind of talk as well as these kids can, you know, these 20 year olds can. And again, I'm not trying to be patronizing by calling 20 year old kids, but to me, they're very young, you know. Uh, so, so it's not exclusive in terms of purely Pakistani, purely young, purely men, purely women. You'd see women there, you'd see kids, no kind of family events. There's a bit of carnivalesque about them as well. You know, so these are moments and opportunities 
that are organized in an ad hoc, organic, completely unsanctioned way uh, by these uh, aficionados, by these people who are very much into this culture. But the weird thing is there's very little infrastructural support coming down from the state level. Now, I'm not saying the government needs to be involved, but, but it'd be interesting to get, say, for example, law enforcement involved. This is one of the points I make in the conclusion. It's like you've got these cultures going on and what are you doing? to what you're doing other than driving driving them no pun intended further underground because you're simply policing them and at these events you know sometimes the police would turn up and they'd shut the event down because there's there, there, there are no sort of licenses in operation there's no consent they often take place in supermarket car parks on a sunday evening when it's shut you know big enough space for 200 cars and then somebody reports them and then the police come along and say, right, you have to shut this down or we're going to start arresting you or giving you tickets or whatever. And there is some form of police interest. Occasionally the police themselves, I was at one where there was a, you know, a couple of coppers walking around admiring the cars because the coppers happen to be petrol heads as well, right? But my bigger point is this aspect of practice, this cultural practice is given no recognition and it's again about that point I was making about working class culture. You're not even acknowledging it. And instead, we're simply demonizing it as something that is bad or inherently problematic. And it gets bound up into all sorts of other narratives about this type of person. The type of person would drive this type of car is also guilty of X, Y and Z, you know. Can we, um, so some of you, the, the title of your book is Race, Taste and Class. So. So we can we unpack some of those, some of the findings around those um, phrases yeah, around race. Well, well, go on then. Tell me. Well, Ask me some things. Saying just now, people get labelled, don't they? Because of the culture right. is recognised. It is a form of resistance, but there are a, a certain kind of um, person is associated with a certain right. car. Okay. So, what did the young, what did the men have to say about this themselves? <laughs> Right. And okay. What do you find about race and cars? Sure. Okay. So, so let me be quite explicit about this, right? And I've and I've said this before, and it got woefully misinterpreted. I'm not sure if it was intentionally misinterpreted. So, I'm not saying that men, young men, Pakistani men, who drive nice cars, let's just say nice cars, relatively modern and expensive cars, are drug dealers. I, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying. I'm saying the opposite of that. Okay. Right. I just wanted to be clear about that. However. Uh, there is this narrative in Bradford that young South Asian heritage driver, it doesn't matter, he could be Brazilian for all the difference it makes. If he looks South Asian and he's driving a Merc or a, I don't know, a, a, an Audi, a, a high spec Audi or whatever, then there will be a series of processes in play that will help the person who's doing the observing, perceiving, encountering this phenomena, explain it. So, you know, you see, you're in Manningham, for example, which is my stalking arms, born and bred in Manningham. You see, I mean, this is what happened. I, I, I remember doing these kind of, I was walking along different parts of the city for a different project. And that was about Manningham itself. And uh, I was with a, with a friend of mine uh, and, and actually uh, he's one of the people who's central in me writing this book. He's the person who's been telling me to write it for years. That's Charlie Husband. So Charlie Husband and I were long-term collaborators. And we're walking through Manningham and we see, I think it was either an Aston Martin or a Bentley parked on, on the road, half on the curb, half on the road. And it was in the middle of Manningham, you know, and, and, and I think most people in Manningham and even outside of Manningham, if you go back 20, 25 years, Manningham had a reputation. You know, it was where the riots happened and there were all sorts of problems, no-go no areas, self-segregation, all that stuff that came out in the early 2000s very particular idea in people's imagination as to what Manningham is. Manningham is. And then you see, I, I don't know, whatever uh, an Aston cost then, 40, 50, 60,000 pound car parked in this hood. You see that and you start to wonder, how do you explain that? How does that get there? And one of the outcomes of that thought process is, well, it's obviously either somebody who's visiting, you know, it's either David Beckham who's passing by or it's some rich person, you know, a, a, a landlord, or the most common was, one is, and especially when it comes to cars like Range Rovers and certain other cars, it's a drug dealer or it's a gangster, right? 
so that's one of those stereotypical myths, I would say, that exists in Bradford. And I know the potency of this myth, partly because uh, I've talked to people who who believe in it. So I, I so I, I I interviewed one person, very successful, affluent, middle class, Pakistani heritage person, and uh, we got to the topic of these nice cars in Bradford. You know, there's a lot of nice cars in Bradford, um, and uh, the response was, "Yeah, well, we know where all the money comes from, right?" And, and my response was, and I think this is in the book as well. I, I was a bit cheeky and a bit mischievous. And I said, well, I, yeah, it comes from the bank, right? Where else? No, 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 that's not what we're talking about. We, you know where it comes from. Where does it come from? Well, it's, they're all drug dealer cars, aren't they? That's where the money comes from. And then I said to her, completely straight-faced, and again, it was being mischievous because I know this wasn't the case. So you're a drug dealer then. And the reason I said that was because this person who I was interviewing had a £40,000 car parked in the drive. So why doesn't the same apply to you? And I think, you know, other people, people, other academics, other researchers, other theorists have written about this stuff as well. People like Franz Fanon. And they said, you know, the moment, uh, if you like, uh, minority identities start internalizing the language and the myths of the, of the oppressor, that's when the battle becomes harder to undo these myths. And in Bradford, there is a lot of circularity around seeing a nice car, who's driving it, young black driver driving a, a nice car, there is a that's an equation, and there is something after the, uh, the after the equal sign. If you think of it as a mathematical equation, right? You know, gangster car, nice neighbourhood, equals, oh, and plus BME driver equals drug dealer. So those exist, and I don't think they're even statistically or financially possible. Uh, simply by virtue of the fact that if it were the case, there'd be probably more drug dealers than there were drug users. Do you know what I mean? I just find that myth quite troubling, but it's also embedded through the force of race. You know, you, it, it is, there are strong correlations between how these myths are circ circulated and embedded alongside existing narratives around racial and ethnic identity, because the expectations are there. The expectations or the lack of expectations are there, helping to reinforce some of these myths. So, sorry, why, why do they think, um, why do so many people think uh, Asian men in flashy cars are drug dealers? Well, I, I think if you, if you pair it back a bit and go back a little bit, my thinking of this is, well, at one level, it's very kind of crude, right? Uh, and it's in the 1970s, BMWs, the, the, the initials BMW stood for two kind of racialized epithets. So one was people would call BMWs Bob Marley wagons, or they would call them black man's wheels, right? That was racialized in and of itself. And there was an association at that time in the 70s and 80s even, that if African, uh, uh, African Caribbeans were somehow predisposed to being gangsters, yardies, pimps, muggers, all that stuff. So there's that, and I think to some extent, uh, South Asian, some South Asian identities have taken on that mantle, just generally speaking within the public discourse. The other thing is, uh, there is this issue of disproportionality, and I'm not talking about arrest right now. So let's just go back to the example I gave you of an expensive car in an inner city neighborhood, right? So we know what an inner city neighborhood is. We know what Manningham is. We know the narratives, right? So Manningham, it's not the wealthiest, you know, it's not Grassington, it's not Bil uh, Bingley, it's not Hebden Bridge, it's none of these outlying areas, it's not relatively affluent, right? So we know that. The other thing that we know is there is a high, relatively high proportion of BME individuals living, on, and families living in neighbourhoods like Manningham. So in some of the literature, these are called zones of transi transition, zones of transition, which are, are really like those neighbourhoods, like, so Manningham, parts of West Bowling, you know, other parts of the city, they've got relatively, relatively affordable housing stock. And if not that, they've got relatively affordable rentable stock. So you'll find that, you know, going back 10 or 15 years, even people, you know, you have migrant communities and families living in those neighborhoods because it's a question of resources, essentially. Uh, but within a generation or two, which is the case in my family, you know, I was born and brought up in Manningham. 
lived in Manningham until I was about, well, and neighborhoods like Manningham until I was about 30, until I transitioned out. And I transitioned out into a more affluent habit, uh, neighborhood when I could afford to. And there are reasons why that happened as well. And it's got to do with kind of Pakistani culture in relation particularly to remittances, sending money back home, which is something that my parents might have done, but it's not something that I do sort of habitually. Right, so the, I've got more disposable income. But I know that Manningham isn't Bingley. And I know that only a certain type of economically defined person will live there. And I also know a certain amount of information and knowledge about BME communities. Well, I think I know. What I'm saying is out there in the public imagination, there are lots of these narratives about who, who, what does a Pakistani young male look like? Well, we kind of know. And this is because this is what the government and the politicians and the academics and the journalists tell us. Generally speaking, young BME males tend to underperform educationally, educationally, uh, and, sorry, and economically. So they don't do too well at school, they don't do too well at uni if they go, and then they don't do too well in the, in the world of work. So we know that these guys are, they're not Billy Millionaire, right? They're not the wealthiest people in the world as well. We know that they're living in these neighborhoods that are in the literature and statistically relatively deprived. You know, they suffer multiple indicators of urban deprivation. That's the kind of language that we hear about these neighborhoods. We overlay these neighborhoods and that information around these identities and on these individuals. And then we encounter them in the real world with an expensive car. So we've got all this background knowledge going on there. We know that, well, statistically or economically, this person shouldn't be able to afford that car. And therefore the drug dealer becomes the immediate instantaneous and almost coherent jump to make. And I think it's also racialized simply because of the ways in which that background noise about BME communities operates as well. As well as, look, you know, you, you can read the local newspaper for this and look at the ways in which, in a sense, BME stories are covered compared to non-BME stories. Have a look at how many, I mean, people do content analysis on this all the time, news media, for example, around uh, ethnicity and, and whether there are positive or negative stories about them. So there's a background there already that's very, very skewed and biased that leads people to believe or more likely to believe in certain certain storylines and narratives as I say. So I live in Manningham, can you explain why do you think car insurance is so much more expensive in Manningham than it is in London? Uh, I have, well I've written about, there's a bit about this but in the book. For 10 minutes down the road in Thackley. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. It's I know. like nearly £2,000 for a... Right. Uh, so, about, pounds uh, down the road. I think it was 2016, there, there's this organisation called the Motor Insurance Bureau or something, and, and they have a responsibility for paying out people when there's a non, when there's an accident, but the it's an uninsured driver who's caused the accident. But they, they did some research around uh, what they called ethnic penalties in insurance. And they didn't just focus on Bradford, they focused on quite a few. And there's a report, it's available online, you can download it. I think it's called Ethnic Penalties in Car Insurance. And, and, and according to them, they said they couldn't explain it, not statistically. They couldn't explain it uh, as a matter of actuarial practice, i.e. you know, insurance processes. But what they were basically saying, there appears to be the case that if you live in an ethnically diverse area, you're going to be penalised to some extent. Personally, I think there's probably more than that. I think, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm perhaps being a bit conspiratorial here, but uh, I, again, every few years, there's a bit of research that comes out about employment. So I, mean, I know it's about employment, it's different, but it's relevant. So what, what some of these surveys and uh, sort of experiments do is they'll send out application forms for jobs and they'll be identical application forms with the only difference being the name on the applicants. So they'll send one Shabin Aslam with, uh, with whatever information on it and then they'll send one for, I don't know, somebody who sounds European, Jane Smith, with the identical information other than the name. Right, but they'll do this in a big scale. They'll they'll sell hundreds of thousands of these forms out. And here's the thing: if you've got a non-European sounding name, you've got less chance of being shortlisted. 
and if you've got less chance of being shortlisted, you've got less uh, chance of being uh, invited for interview. And I think something similar may be going on. There may be something like bias of some kind. I don't want to call it racism because, you know, you'd need more evidence to make that claim. But it, but it's not uncommon in all sorts of ways. You know, I, I, I mean, there was a piece of research I read for, for the book. In America, there is this uh, similar, there's been lots of research around race and, and car buying. You know, if you're BME, heritage or a woman in some some well in one piece of research you ended up paying more for your car than if you're white and american and male right so it's not just race so if you're a woman and you're bme then you kind of got the double bind if you're a woman you might be getting more hassle as well you know more more of a penalty so if we have a nice car uh, where everybody thinks we're drug dealers and also they try to stop us having nice cars by charging us too much insurance well, it's not even nice cars, but even crap cars will, co you know, there are people that I talk to in the research, their cars are worth 300 quid, then paying upward of 2,000 pounds to insure the damn thing, you know? So just before I hand it over to our lovely audience to ask you questions, um, I just want to ask you finally just about taste. taste. So you talked about taste. As yeah. In, um, well, you talked uh, it through Bordeaux and uh, how taste is used to um, symbolize um, class and also to communicate that to other people. So by modifying, uh, I suppose it's going back to what we were saying earlier, um, cars as resistance and then modifying them in order to um, find other people who are like, uh, who, who think like you and think of the world in the same way as you do. So, yeah, arguably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, talk about I mean, that. I, 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 again, borrowed very heavily uh, from this French guy, Pierre Bourdieu, who was really active in the 70s and very, you know, he was a philosopher, cultural theorist, and everybody kind of claimed him in terms of disciplines. You know, so sociologists wanted to say he was a sociologist, philosophers saying he's a philosopher and all that. But he's been used very di in very diverse ways. But his uh, sort of 1976 or 79 book, uh, it was called uh, Taste, a distinction of something i'm it's, it's you can you can look it up you can google it up i forget the title at the moment uh but he talked about taste as um something that isn't in a way natural so you know we all like to think that we've got good taste or we've got taste and it's very specific to us that that you know our taste is something very personal and it's something that's evolved only through us and without anybody else's interference but that's absolutely not the case for for, for Bourdieu. For Bourdieu's argument was, look, you know, where you're brought up, how you're brought up, that is the place where your taste is transmitted. And he called this 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 arena sort of habitus. He called it habitus. And it's it's not just where you live, but it's the schools you go to. And it's the fact that you you may go you, you may fo play football as opposed to, I don't know, something more elitist like uh, lacrosse or something. I don't know. I don't know if it is elitist, but something different. And 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 taste comes to be as a result of all those interactions throughout your life. It's partly through your family and it's partly through uh, the environment you're in. Uh, and a way to see it is, for example, if if somebody who's crudely working class like me, you know, I said I was working class uh, in terms of economic status. I was working class, and now from you know, I'm I'm very grateful of the fact that I'm probably economically working class. But I've probably still got quite a lot of working class culture. So the difference between culture and economic status, right, when it comes to class. Uh, in that, you know, I, I, I still have the same sort of working class tastes. Maybe they've shifted over the years. I don't know. But if I were to suddenly in, to inherit a billion pounds, right, or to win the lottery, uh, it, may, it may be very easy for me to afford all the trappings of middle class culture. I could buy a ham, uh, a mansion. I could buy a great big Rolls Royce. I could do all sorts of things. I could buy, you know, a horse, a stable. I could start going to casinos. I could start going to theatre, uh, uh, you know, opera, all that stereotypically and cliched, admittedly, middle class stuff. But I wouldn't have the experience or the skills required in order to pass as authentically mid middle class. Right. It's this. It's a bit like this. Not. Cars. Sorry. 
What's that got to do with modifying cars? What that's got to do with modifying cars is we know. T I was giving you a background of Bordeaux, really. So that's, why that, that's just a bit of background. So what that's got to do with so what Bordeaux says about taste is like we know what our taste is, and we know the taste of others as well because it's not our taste. And taste is such a powerful thing that it can even induce induce the disgust of others. So you know, so well, what I, well, let's think about that. So you know, we know what that is, and we may not like to confess it, but you know, as quite decent and respectable and nice and tolerant people, we will know what it means to say and to hear the word chav, right? We all know what chav means. Now, for me, that chav. I don't really know what it means. I don't really like it. I think it's quite a sort of fascistic term. I don't like it, but I know what it means. And it's not, and, and it, and it's about an identity that has a very particular aesthetic. It's about somebody who looks and behaves a very particular way, right? And that usage of the word chav on that identity, in a sense, labels them as not like us, as not nice, not good, not virtuous, not morally sound. The chav is somebody who will have no taste. He will wear Burberry clothes. He will wear, he will drink cider and stuff. You know, a nefarious, not evil necessary character, but not a, a righteous citizen, let's say. So that's what taste has got to do with cars, because when we see these loud, brash cars, we see these souped up, uh, you know, Hondas, Golfs, Audis with a loud exhaust, the thumping bass, the great big speakers in the boot the paintwork, all those flicks of what I call creativity and individuation, it's not uncommon to experience remarks that are less than positive, you know, uh, about they're just so loud, terrible, shameful, you know, they're such disruptions. And let's be honest, worse, there's a hell of a lot of colourful language about people who drive those sorts of cars, right? Yeah. And and that comes from a place of taste. That taste is not good, essentially. That's what that taste is saying. And and this even, as I said, comes from people who are middle class. You know, I spoke to Pakistani people. They're driving five series BMWs, business people in their 40s. And they've got a lot to say about these cars. Like, you know, why would anybody do that? They're ruining these perfectly good cars. You know, they're making them so loud, so brash. And here's the kicker. One guy called them crass. Just so crass. Now, if crass isn't about taste, and I don't know what is, so taste figures into it a lot. But again, it's a combination. It's not merely about uh, class, if you like, but it's also a combination uh, and a hybridization of ethnicity as well. Uh, because you have these different, in a sense, ethnically diverse class cultures operating in relation to car modification, for example. Thank you very much. Um, it's nearly 10 to 7, so I'm going to hand oh, it over wow. to the audience. Um, so there's a question and answer section uh, function. Oh, oh God. All right. Yes. I'll leave that to you. So right. do you want to ask me? I don't know what to do. I'm. Uh... Okay. So uh, there's a qu question from uh, Sonia Zeb. Um, Sonia, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question uh, directly? Are you still there? Probably got to sleep, maybe. Who knows? Oh, do you want to ask somebody else to ask? I'll or... ask you a question for you, Sonia. Sonia Zeb asked a question. Yeah. Eunice, do you think Hello. buying cars and having the best car, wanting the best car, is part of these communities showing that they have economic wealth? So, like a status symbol, even yeah. though they are working class and or belong to those communities hmm. yeah to some extent i mean again this is that my work isn't really about producing these generalizable sort of statements about anything so uh, but I'll, I'll try to kind of carve it up uh, as efficiently as i can so on the one hand yes so uh, uh paul gilroy who's a sociologist very you know uh, gripping stuff around uh, uh, race equality he talks about uh, the american context and how blacks in america in, in new york and in Chicago and other places demonstrate a disproportionate investment in their cars so you know they may have been sort of living close to the poverty line but their cars looked good right and that was about demonstrating status to a large extent there's more going on than that but let's just say it was that so I think some of that goes on here but actually at the same time a lot of people are middle class 
there is a lot of wealth in Bradford. There is a lot of entrepreneurship. So people, and in that domain, you know, people are feeling quite entitled to look, you know, if I want to buy a nice car, I'll buy a nice car. What's it got to do with anybody? What business it is of mine? What car I drive? So there is that quite rational economic entitlement or sense making place, despite knowing what the risks are. Despite knowing that, you know, if you're driving a nice car, you're going to be either looked at as somebody who's got dodgy means to finance the car or to buy the car or you're a drug dealer. Or it may even increase your chances of being stopped and searched by the police. Despite that, people, even there is this kind of middle class resistance going on. So that's the other th point of the argument about resistance. It's not purely working class. Middle class, economically at least, middle class people who drive nice cars that seem to be beyond their means. Even they're prepared to acknowledge the deficits against which they're working and prepared to work against uh, as a person, as a matter of kind of personal pride or entitlement or reward. So a lot of people I talk to, it's like, I deserve it. I work hard. You know, I brought my family up. Why shouldn't I buy a nice car? I live in a nice house. What, I pay my bills. I tax. You know, one of the interviews got not offended with me, but offended with a question, basically told me to F off. You know, it did tell me F off, but he was basically saying, what business is it of anybody's? What, are, what car I drive? I've been working my whole life since I was 16 years old. I've built my businesses up. I own my own home. I pay my taxes. I own my cars. They're taxed. They're insured. And, you know, basically go F yourself for asking me uh, about, you know, where my money comes from for my cars. Why should I tell anybody anything? So, again, that's about being savvy, I think, and I'm being cued into the narratives around ethnicity uh, at the same time. Thank you. So, I have a question you, from yeah. Saira Shakir, Dr. Oh, Allen. Oh, What's your view on the driving culture, driving style, driving <laughs> practice in Bradford? Driving practice in Bradford. I think people need more of it. <laughs> <laughs> right, I kind of expected something like this. So this is somebody, I, I'm speaking to somebody who was a young driver once. So, you know, kind of confessing. Uh, when I was younger, it was much easier to drive like a lunatic. It was, what it was, you know, there weren't the speed cameras, there were fewer cars, and the cars actually were a lot crapper. You know, uh, uh, you know, the first few cars I had were quite big engines by today's standards, but, you know, they'll probably get eaten by a Nissan Micra or something. You know, that's how evolved the technology was. However, I think now, you know, that there is, there seems to be, and again, this isn't part of my research. I didn't do any kind of statistical evidence with the police or anybody else for that matter, but there seems to be a preponderance of, perception there seems to be a belief that there that there is a lot of dangerous driving i don't think it's any more dangerous than other urban centers if i'm absolutely honest that's not to say it's not a problem i think it is a problem and i think one of the reasons why it's going to continue to be a problem let's just say it is a problem that too many people drive recklessly let's just call it like call it that you know and i think if that continues then you know there's sadly going to be more deaths and that's very very sad and, you know, people talked about that in the book and they were saying things like, well, you know, these three young, there was, there was an incident, I think maybe a year or a year, maybe slightly longer, three young lads uh, took a police chase, they got they wrapped their car around a, a, a tree. Uh, you know, I think two or all of them died. And the next day, there were all these expressions of sorrow and sympathy, quite right, you know. And other people were, and some of the interviews were saying, yeah, you know, it's very sad. And, uh, you know, you have people saying, oh, so and so who died in this car crash. He was a really good, really good lad. He was a model kid, student, and all that. And then the person I'm talking to is saying, "Well, if he was that good, he wouldn't have been caught. He wouldn't have done that in that car." So there is this sense of, you know, on the one hand, we have sorrow and we have regret and remorse for these lives that are lost too early. Fine, and that's appropriate. But equally, I don't think enough is being done to kind of educate younger drivers. And again, that's something that a lot of the participants talked about. And one of the problems seemed to be that. You know, especially younger drivers, and there is an assertion that younger drivers are less experienced to some extent. They are, in some cases, given cars that they simply cannot control. And this isn't me trying to be patronizing or being everybody, every young driver's dad or anything, you know. Uh, but but that seems to be a common thread, that young younger drivers driving cars in ex that, that can go not to 60 in seven or eight seconds, which is very, very quick. Right. And the next thing you know, they're in an accident. There's that. And then there's the other issue around the etiquette. And I agree, uh, you know, as I'm getting older, I'm becoming more grumpy and more miserable. And one of the constant reasons for that is the is the kind of uncivil driving I encounter. It's very bad mannered driving, you know, people blocking off a road because they're having 
a conversation. And again, that might be just me being biased or, you know, generalizing from a few encounters like that that I've in, that I've you know been involved with. And you know, if you horn these guys. You know, there's a real risk that one of them is going to get out and lamp you one or something, right? So there's there's a kind of a sense of trepidation with driving as well. Not only you know that that the road is a very risky place statistically, you know, it's a very risky place. Uh, but then there's the risks can be magnified depending on what happens on the road with you. So sorry if that's not a fulsome answer, uh, Syra. That was brilliant. Thank you. Um, we've got time for a couple more. I'll just whiz through them. Carol wants to know, did your respondents talk about how their tastes in cars evolved, changed through their lives, and um, they, could they use their taste in cars to pinpoint life events? Uh, that's a really good question. A uh, really good set of questions, in, in a way. Um, I didn't really focus on taste as a as an element of change throughout a life or throughout their lives up to that point. But I did kind of trace it to their kind of locale or where they lived and how they were brought up and that kind of thing. And it seemed to connect with that. And for the most part, it didn't really evolve other than, you know, when we talked about what other things they consumed. So, you know, I mean, not that it needed to be said, but they, they weren't, more often than not, I think more or less wholly, they weren't connoisseurs of fine art and things like that. You know, I, I was mostly fixated on car, car consumption. So I asked about TV programming and films. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the younger drivers talked about uh, the toys that they played with when they were kids. So there was one guy who told a really interesting story about the Batmobile. Uh, the Michael Keaton Batmobile, uh, mm. the Keaton Mobile it was called, I think at the time, and this is going back to the early, late 80s, early 90s, and how that was really the thing that really got him into cars as a cultural thing, as something to be interested in. Uh, and I'm sorry, I've missed the other parts of the questions. Uh, did you well, how, um, how did... Yeah, you... so sorry, sorry to interrupt you there, uh, Shabina. So the other, the other thing, which is a kind of an adjunct to this, car research is uh it, it was it was you know, any energy research you do you can kind of spiral it off into any way anywhere really but i really got interested into it in the scene of weddings you know pakistani weddings and that was partly because i was talking to guys who hired out these cars for weddings and i was talking to people you know parents who just got one of their kids married and they're talking they're complaining oh god we just spent two grand on a car for a weekend or whatever so then I started talking about weddings and it was in that context where people were talking about lifestyle and I was talking about what sort of wedding would you like? You know, what do you sort of have to, uh, do you anticipate? And that's my next project. Probably I'm going to be looking at Pakistani or Asian or working class or, or whatever weddings. I've yet to finalize that. <laughs> but even in that, you know, I'm still working on that. But but even in that context, there, were, there was a bit of diversity. So there were some people who would kind of very um who were very interested in doing a big kind of showy wedding you know with the cars and the big dress and the big hall and the lot big invite list and all that and some people didn't like that and for them so this is where taste comes in in terms of inducing the disgust of others for them that kind of wedding so these were kind of more middle class people they would call themselves that was really kind of uh horrible and tacky type of wedding no no for our daughter we're going to have a very simple uh, and, and in some cases very religious uh, ceremony we're just going to do a nakar and we're going to invite a few people for the food and then rather than spending 30 or 40 thousand pounds on a wedding affair we're going to put down a deposit for a home for them right so that was the way i sort of saw that was one sort of life moment where i kind of picked up the continuation of of taste as something that's that's present or can be noticed. Thank you for that question. Carol. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So it's um, we're running out of time now. So um, I just there's a couple of shout outs people want to make. One for the Bradford Modified Club. There's okay. A, this Sunday, God willing, Ingleby Road, BD8, uh, Lidl Car Park, 6 p.m. And okay. I think they've got an Instagram page. Yeah. And um, Commonwealth Theatre, as you know. Are, um, as you know, because I think your son's in the show, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. 
So Commonwealth Theatre are doing um, a new production about um, about um, the modi uh, the Bradford Modified Car Club. Well, in partnership with them, and it's delving into this area a bit more. So I think that's all we've got time for. I'd like to uh, please um, well, <laughs> silently applaud Dr. Eunice Allen. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, the mics are turned off apparently. I've just been yeah. reading through the messages. So this is the book that we've been basing the conversation yeah. on. Today. Can I just give a, if anybody's interested in buying it, I'm not trying to plug it, but you can probably get it a bit cheaper if you subscribe to the publisher's uh, mailing list. I think you get 35% off, uh, somebody was telling me from the publishers. And it's, it's published Press. Policy Press, yeah. Uh, uh, so if you just do Google for Policy Press or, or do the book, you'll, you'll get a hit there if anybody's interested in buying it. It's a very good, it's very well written. Um, it's engaging and it's not, um, and, he, and he explains that he's not doing it so that it's, it's written to be accessible. Uh, it's not full of uh, yeah. academic language and lots of... Um, referencing all over the place it's a great read thank you thank you yeah Unit. can i just yeah just quickly um I, i'm i don't know if people want to continue i'm happy to kind of hang around unless it's got a time limited thing if you're not it's fine i'm happy to take the questions but the other thing is uh, uh just about the book uh I, I i was asked to write the book and the reason I, I i said yes very quickly was because this publisher was very interested in producing accessible sociology and for me that's really the point of sociology if it's not accessible and if it's not meaningful to people across the board then there's no point me doing it you know I, I or anybody doing it actually for it to just sit as within universities and so on so I just thought I'd throw that in there as well that it, it is meant to be and if it is impenetrable then you know you can get in touch with me and I'll give you your money back or something but I hope it's not. So I think I think we should draw it to a close now um, and uh, of course Eunice is at the university I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, uh, engage in an email conversation should you want to ask him anything more Eunice I'm sure you would talk to people sure yeah if anybody's got any I mean there are a few questions that's why I thought it was a bit you, you know that it's not that it was mean or anything but we've only got so much time at the moment and I don't want to encroach on anybody else's time but if people want to ask any more questions or they want to yeah. stick around uh, you, you can put them in the comment box as long as the organizers and the hosts are okay with that if they're not obviously we'll have to draw it to a close I just find it really enjoying, that's all. I'm, I'm living a very sad and lonely life these days with COVID and lockdown, as quite a few, a few of us are. Yeah, it's fine for you to carry on. Okay. Well, if anybody out there uh, would like to raise their question, please type your question back in. I'll copy and paste it back in and I'll... So Sonia Zeb did ask a few. Um... I don't I know, but yeah, I... I, I can't really move my mouse around so much, right. I'm sorry, so I don't know what they are. Um, cars fe heavily feature in black culture, for example, hip hop videos, movies that attract black audiences and have diverse casts. How much do you think the younger South Asian community is influenced by this? And where do you think this influence originates from? Okay. Uh, so I, I'm not, so, so, well, in the book, there's a whole chapter on media. So there's a, a, a kind of deconstructor, some TV programs and some songs, some hip hop songs, ostensibly, including, uh, I'm sure it's one of everybody's playlist out there, German Whip by Meridian Dan and others. So I just <laughs> dropped that in there to demonstrate my street credibility. Um, so I think you're absolutely right, Sonia. Uh, cars do feature very heavily, uh, but, but, in a way, only really from the 90s onwards in terms of hip-hop culture. Before that, not so much. And when they did feature, it, it was the car that was somehow, uh, either in lyrics or in a video, uh, it was a, it was a almost, almost a plot device within these songs. So there's one or two songs in the book that I refer to where that happens. But since then, sort of since the 90s onwards, there's been thousands of songs in which the car features either prominently or just there as a kind of symbol. And I think, again, that the, the, the quite easy answer is one is it, it's obvious. You know, when it comes to music videos, it, it's a state, state of symbol. And I think hip hop really is this culture uh, which, assert, which is very assertive about black identity, uh, you know, in the African-American context. 
uh, and it's about reclaiming and it's about empowering and it's about all those things right and it's very assertive and it's almost assertive to the point of being offensive to white cultures and you know i've read some interesting work around that as well so i think coupled with that being there and the fact that hip-hop culture and hip-hop music is almost universal now there are ver variations of hip-hop pretty much across the world right it's not a surprise that we would encounter that you know even people my age and especially younger people uh, i don't really know how sort of prominent things like mtv are these days but i know that hip-hop is transmitted on social media and everything else incessantly it's there all the time so it's not a surprise to some extent that people would buy into that and i think one of the appealing things so sonia calls it a, a influence i think uh one of the one of the appealing things about hip hop hip hop is to some extent it is uh i mean despite the fact that it's heavily commodified and it's all about the benjamins and it's all about money and blunts and all the rest of it it is still a form of resistance hip hop is still the kind of ultimate type of resistance that uses capitalism against capitalism almost so and again i'm not saying that the young people in bradford pakistani heritage or whatever are very have a very have any understanding let alone a highly sophisticated understanding of all that discourse but i think there is a capacity to latch on to what repre uh, what hip-hop represents and signifies and i think that's the appeal of it not to mention let's be honest the actual genre itself hip-hop is designed to be very appealing in terms of its construction in terms of its beats in terms of its uh flamboyance and all the rest of it it is it's, it's not a wonder that it's the most successful genre of music ever it's surpassed rock and roll you know it's surpassed punk rock punk rock was the new rock and roll at one time but punk rock didn't make a dent in rock and roll whereas hip-hop has now more or less surpassed it by virtue of the fact that even rock music traditional rock music has elements of hip-hop technology and culture within it so i think hip-hop is just again it's one of those things that ubiquitous it's very appealing i think there are sort of real dangers with with some of it you know where people are very uncritical of it where consumers uncritically ape the culture and you know even hip-hop itself is is built on myths and and stereotypes as well everything from uh the gangster stuff uh gangster rap which isn't real there's no such thing as gangster rap it's an invention by a, a white jewish liberal well I'm not sure if he's liberal uh journalist back in the 80s you know about krs1 this is gangster rap <clears throat> that was on that was a reference that was only made because they were dressed like 1940s ga gangsters on the album cover but the next thing you know there is this whole genre of gangster rap which is now real and it's all about drug dealing and everything else which is invariably untrue or at least finessed and uh amplified and then the next thing you know there is a whole body of hip hoppers professional hip hop musicians who are saying i'm actually a drug dealer and now i want to be a hip hop rapper a rap rapper hip -hop hopper don't know what the phrasing is obviously sorry for going on there okay so um we've got a few more questions now why would a car become so prominent in pakistani lifestyles culture to such a point that it almost becomes their identity and a symbol of the race why would it why would yeah. that um why is it sure. so prominent that it's become a well, symbol the, well, of, uh, the, well it, it, it's easier to move around in a car so i think the, the, th the thing is it's not exactly statistically but you know cars move around <clears throat> right people are in cars yeah. so you you kind of have more profile rather than being static so by virtue of the car, the fact that car the car itself is mobile it's always moving around the identity therefore that it's transmitting is mobile as well so that's my way of kind of thinking about that i'm not saying it's right but my it, because they're everywhere and all over the place uh, certain cars for example well certain cars become associated very strongly with certain genders well you know think about <clears throat> until quite recently anything that was pink especially cars associated with women invariably women and there are certain cars that are associated with women you know for so certain models minis some minis are like well it's a woman's car and i've got this from people who drive minis and i've got this from people who work in the car trade who've sold countless minis and they're saying to me well i know that you know if i buy a mini i know that nine times out of ten a woman's going to buy it or a bloke's going to buy it for a daughter or a wife or whatever 
So there are these associations, there are signifiers with cars, and it's partly because the object itself is in more than one place at once in some ways. It's always in motion, isn't it? It's always moving. Not always, unless it's parked up, but it's, it's got more capacity to be seen when it's moving rather than a house, which is always static, unless it's a caravan. No, that's lovely. I like that. That's beautiful. So, Sonia, again, how can we encourage the community meets? Safe spaces for this hobby? Uh, and change right. the negative narratives you have discussed? Yeah. <clears throat> so that's a really good question again, Sonia. Uh, and this is something I kind of end the book on. And it was that point about, look, unless this culture is recognized and acknowledged as valuable, as intrinsically valuable, right? The people who take part in this culture find it a very worthwhile endeavor in the way that people who take part in landscape painting or photography or making pots or flower arranging, they find that very valuable. <clears throat> they find it important. It's therapy, it's creative, it's something. Unless this culture is recognized as that, then you just we're just gonna carry on with the same crap. And unless, my view is, this needs to be supported very explicitly and very clearly, and it needs to come in Bradford from the local state. I think that the local state is really missing a massive opportunity to kind of make inroads into supporting not just young people across the board, but help, helping them appreciate their own identities. You know, 20 odd years ago, there were the, the central government introduced social cohesion as a policy. And it was, to my mind, it was completely invented and almost nonsensical. But you turn up to these meets and you see that cohesion. And it's got nothing to do with the fact that these are, ethnicity's got nothing to do with it. Age has got nothing to do with it, gender has got nothing to do with it, and neither has anything else. The only thing that is relevant in those contexts is the car. Doesn't matter if you've got a piece of shit car and you take it to that event and you shine it up, somebody else will recognize your endeavor. Your endeavor will be appreciated. So the centrality of the car for this cohort of people can't be overstated. You know, I'm not saying it's like more important than life or religion or anything like that. But it's like one of the few things that is discernibly present in their lives. And what do we do? Well, we at best we ignore it. And at worst we demonize it. So I think that needs to be upset. That needs to be turned around. If we're going to get the most out of these people. When I say these people, you know, it's not, a, I'm not being despising. I'm talking about younger people who feel the effects of this every day. You drive a nice car, it's your pride. I've talked to guys about their cars and they spent years doing their cars up and their lavish attention and their hearts are broken when something goes wrong, right? These are really heavy personal, emotional and financial investments, right? And what do they get for their trouble? They get sneering looks or they get disproportionate interest on the part of the police. That's what they get for their trouble. And I think, I think that in and of itself is problematic. Thank you very much. So, question from Usman Ahmed. Did any of your participants speak of the impact these negative associations have had on them, particularly in how they view British society and their participation in it? Thinking, he's mm. thinking of friends who have said, having these cars is a bit of an F off to society that denies them opportunities and yet calls them out for so-called not succeeding. Yeah. Strong words there from Usman. F off to society. Well, 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 Usman. Uh, yes and no. So, so in some cases, as I've said, people are fully aware of that. Some people faced lots and lots of interest, officially and non-officially. You know, people were, uh, even at the level of family, you know, getting chastised by parents and stuff for modding up their cars off, having big sound systems in there. And there was a couple of young guys, one of them, very explicit saying, I wouldn't dare put my volume up when I'm driving around near my home in case somebody who knows my dad sees me and hears me and tells my dad and then my dad, you know, gives me a huge bollocking. So they're, they're, they're fully aware of it, but they do it despite that. And, and the other thing is in terms of, uh, I, I'd say, yeah, it's kind of what's deemed to be, um, I'm not struggling to find the right word. I've struggled before with this word. Uh, sort of civil British society in a way you know what's deemed to be acceptable and appropriate and 
and uh, a good form of being a citizen, they know that what they're rehearsing constitutes the opposite of that, but they do it despite it. So again, it is a kind of resistance to my resistance to my mind, uh, and it is very personal. You know, it is something that they feel the effects of almost on a daily basis. You know, it, it, as I said, if it's not uh, on the part of family members and friends, uh, it, it's through law enforcement, even things like number plates. You know, if you've got the wrong kind of number plate, you're going to get pulled and you're going to get fined. And even if you're not speeding, just because the car, your car may look quick or fast, the police may be interested and decide to kind of pull you over, give you a search for all sorts of reasons. And one of the guys I talked about, I mean, this was years ago, this was even before this research, and it stands out in my memory to this day. This is going back maybe 15 years. And he said, look, you know, I get pulled all the time by the police. The guy happened to drive a nice car. It was a nice, quite... Uh, out, outstanding car. What I mean by that, it, it stood out a mile. And uh, he said, I get pulled by the police all the time. And even one time, I got, I've been pulled by the same copper more than once. And he said, I, I started talking to this copper who was going through my car. And in those days, he was giving me a producer, which meant you had to go up to the police station with proof of MOT insurance and all that and ownership. And the, the officer asked him, well, what is it you do to a vouchers? He said, officer, I work for the Inland Revenue. You know, so the irony, irony is, you know, the tax man, this is the tax man and he's getting done for this. Oh, he's getting pulled. Oh, he's getting a disproportionate interest, which is having a disruption on his life, I guess. Nobody needs that. I'm not so. I'm not sure if that's answered Usman's question, so I'm sorry, <laughs> Usman. We did. It, well, um, I think so. Repraise, we... in that case. So, <laughs> last, uh, one of the last questions. So we'll have to finish at 7.30 at the latest, okay? Yeah, that, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, fine. Great. Question Thank you. Question from Jim Goddard. Oh. It's a question plus a statement. I sometimes come across groups of young white male petrol heads who have clearly pimped their cars. Is there significant interaction between different ethnic groups of petrol heads or is it very segregated? I know you have mentioned that there are some female members of these groups, which suggests that at least the gender boundaries are not that strict. Great. Thank you, Jim Goddard. And again, somebody who's showing his street cred by using the phrase pimped out their cars. Uh, so, yeah, I've actually talked about this in the book as well. So I, I, turning, I was turning up to these car meets and they were, you know, populated with cars and, and their drivers and owners. And a, a few of them, uh, the ones that I went to, the, the organizers were very keen to make sure that they were diverse in all sorts of ways. They kind of wanted a family vibe with them. You know, so, you know, I even saw the right toddlers and kids kicking about in toy cars with them, you know, in these supermarket car parks. So it was a very kind of um, uh, sort of not festival atmosphere, but very, you know, friendly, vibrant, light atmosphere. But what I know, and I turned up to one of these very early doors. So there was probably like me and three other cars or five other cars, including the organizers. And then slowly other cars started trickling in. And here's this is, what, this is my recollection of what happened. So in one part of the car park, I started noticing certain types of cars. And in another part of the car park, quite a way away from this part, there were different cars. And, and then I noticed that in one part of the car park, there are essentially white cars, you know, cars driven by white people. And in the other part, all the Asians were parking up in the other part. I thought, oh, I thought, oh shit, this is, this is bad. This is kind of bad because, you know, um, I got a bit anxious about this. Uh, well, maybe maybe people are keen to self-segregate. You know, this this ethnic segregation. I don't think it is ethnic segregation within the broader cohesion discourse. So anyway, it played out as follows. More and more cars turned up, and and it played out just like that. You know, the white patch of the car park grew bigger and more, and white. You know, became more white, and and so did the Asian or the BME part of the. The car park that grew bigger and more more Asian, but once people got out of their cars, didn't matter. People were circulating all over the place, and by the time the place was like half full, people were parking everywhere. So again, for me, it was like the penny sort of suddenly dropped that people may start off with ideas about the other, the racial other, the ethnic other. They're not like me, so it's safe for me, for me to be with my own kind, crudely speaking, right? Maybe that was going on in people's heads. 
But once people started to look beyond that and instead look at the cars, didn't matter who they were. Do you know what I mean? So I think, again, the, the car represents that potential to break down these barriers that don't necessarily exist. And they only exist in, in our imaginations, I think. Do you know what I mean? I, I think these, these are ghettos of the mind, if you want to, or these are segregated areas of the mind. Every conversation I had with everybody about a car, a week ago, I was out of town. I went to Halifax to pick up a push bike. And in the car park, there's this like gentleman. He's about 50 or 60. And he's driving a 19, late 60s Ford Anglia, right? And this car looks like a hot rod. It has got huge wheels. It's got an, uh, an air intake coming out of the bonnet. It looked amazing. It looked amazing. I just went over and started talking to this guy. The guy didn't know me from Adam. He may have had an idea about me as what a Pakistani is and isn't. But as soon as we started talking about horsepower modifications and everything else, all that didn't matter. We were just talking about the car. And that's the thing. And I'm not saying the car is the secret to world peace or anything like that. No, absolutely not. I mean, the car presents lots of problems in terms of the sustainability of the planet. Nobody's talked about that yet. And I hope they don't. But it does offer this kind of trigger point. And, the, and, and what flows from the car is invariably positive in my experience. And when I've talked to these organizers of these car meets, they've said exactly the same thing. You know, and the feedback they've had from people from out of town who are white, you know, they've had people come from all over the place and they said, you know, we've got an idea of what Bradford is and we were, a bit, were kind of a bit scared, to be honest, about coming to this meet. But it turned out to be a really good meet, really enjoyable. You know, and, and I think anything that can service that getting to know people, I, I'm not a fan of the contact hypothesis, by the way, but I just think it encourages a kind of sharing of experience on, and, and aspiration and all that. I think that's, that's healthy. Thank you. For a final question, <laughs> Eunice. Throughout your, this is from Syrah Shakir. Throughout, oh, research, Syrah before. throughout your research, have you come to a point where you feel you could guess the car model, make a person owns, or would or would like to own, just from how they look no. and their outward experience? No, I, well, I kind of do. I haven't really tested it, so maybe I will. I do kind of guess, though. From time to time, when I meet new people, I do guess. I don't know what you're driving. You've probably told me what I forgot. Probably something a bit older. You're disparaging about it. What was it? It's <laughs> Nissan Micra. There you go. So what are you assuming about me now? It's quite a sensible car, isn't it? Perfectly drivable car, gets you from it a bit, it's functional. You see, you, you don't need to be telling the world who you think you are. You don't care, right? You're quite confident and happy in yourself. I don't care right? what anybody thinks of me. That's what you get from my car. Indeed, right. But, but I can kind of, uh, I mean, this is another thread in the book. Uh, it can guess the, the, the identity, not the name or anything. I can I guess the identity of the driver by the car invariably, mm -hmm. sort of an inversion. So look, even now, uh, there are certain cars that are very strongly associated with, in Bradford, Pakistani drivers. So if anybody's in the room driving a Toyota, you know, probably sort of uh, over than 10, 12 year old Toyota or Nissan or Honda, mostly Pakistani car, but most of the younger drivers tend to go for Audis German, uh, and German cars, you know, Audis, VWs and, uh, and so on and a few others in between, sort of slightly special cars and so on. Uh, but yeah, I, I can kind of guess, and I'm not always spot on, but it, it's a, there are a multitude of uh, possibilities with that one. You know, I mean, we, we can do that another time. We can kind of have a quiz on it, guess the car or something. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you for staying over to answer the questions. So oh, thank you, Shabina. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you to the host and especially to the people in the audience i thought they were great questions and uh, yeah they were brilliant I hope it was... thank you for bradford south asian heritage month who pulled this Indeed. off very quickly and beautifully well done thank you all yeah. okay so um